friends. Thank you for tuning in to Starting Small. Today, I'm joined by Preston Rutherford of Chubbies. Preston, thank you so much for joining me today. Cameron, I'm pumped to be here. Thanks, man. This will be fun. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I want to mention um, I'm a huge fan of what you built. And through high school, um, I don't know if you saw, I made a post a couple of days ago, but in high school, Chubby Shorts was what everyone wanted <laughs> in, my, in my class. So Amazing. I got to say so that. Cool. Yeah, for sure. Such a small world. Yeah. Um, to kick things off, I want to get into your upbringing. Um, what was your childhood? Well, what was your childhood like, and where did you grow up? Grew up in Tucson, Arizona. Okay. And childhood was awesome. I mean, I'm 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 super blessed. You know, didn't come from, um, you know, crazy privilege or anything like that. Like two working parents, totally middle class, and they did everything they could though, to allow me to get exposed to things, you know, like being able to do camps um, on the sports side, but then also on sort of like the arts side. So just got like a really broad exposure to a bunch of things. Yeah. And I know, you know, not everyone gets, gets that kind of situation and, you know, just, just a lot of love, which again, you know, super grateful for. And you know, I think part of it was also <clears throat> just like a really big um, level of importance, importance placed on just the hard work and earning it and being an underdog sort of thing. Yeah. And I think that really kind of carried through, um, it was kind of like imprinted on my DNA sort of thing. But sure. um, yeah, I mean, Arizona, beautiful place, able to you know, like be outdoors 365 days a year, which is just awesome. Mm -hmm. um, but, but not really sort of like a, a hugely entrepreneurial environment, very much like smallish town, traditional jobs, traditional industry sort of thing. Mm. So that, that also kind of very much painted my view of the world and what was possible for the first, let's call it 18 years of my life. Wow. So growing up as a kid, um, what were some of your interests like athletics? Were you entrepreneurial at all? What, what did that look like growing up? Definitely, definitely sports, definitely sports. Uh, I mean, I loved moving around. Um, I, I also really liked art and music and like performance art, uh, mostly like hamming it up sort of thing, trying to make people laugh, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. you know, figuring out how to perform a little bit, how to, um, so sort of like, flexing the or training the muscle of creativity a little bit mm. um and i was also honestly like really into clothes and apparel and brands i mean i think that was always something that was very natural and fun i mean i think from a really early age i would just like buy and sell stuff on Am on excuse me not amazon but on ebay yeah. Just like my used clip, like I didn't, again, I didn't really have money, but I really liked exploring and finding like new shoes and cool t-shirts and things like that. Yeah. So the only way to do it was like buy something on eBay and then when yeah. I was kind of done with it, resell it. So, so the, the whole sort of like e-commerce thing was kind of just like a natural, natural thing, I um, love it. naturally gravitated towards it. Um, and then I think outside of that, I was just really excited to just get involved in a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Um, like the, just the general idea being you've got like this one chance at living on this planet sort of thing, try to make the most of it, just go for it and be all in. Yeah. And so I think yeah, involved in a bunch of clubs and groups and I don't know, just like really trying hard, <laughs> a lot for of sure. just effort. I was, for sure. I would never be characterized as like lazy or chill it was very yeah. much like the opposite just going for it definitely well i'm sure a lot of those interests translated into your years in college but i saw you went on to study at stanford um what did you study there and kind of what was your experience overall there at school you know it was it was awesome i mean so grateful to, i don't know how i got in to be honest <laughs> but um i studied urban design which is you know really interesting the reason i liked it is just because it was so interdisciplinary got to do some economics got to do some history got to even do like art history mm -hmm. um political science 
uh, not only just like basic economics, but like econometric type stuff. So there's a little bit of like the quantitative component. So for me, it was just cool because it was just like a broad set of topics that I could explore. And it was like the singular major that allowed me to do that because mm. I was not ready to just study one thing. Yeah. And so it was perfect from that respect. And it was an amazing experience. I mean, it, honestly, at the beginning, I was like, I don't like this place because it's like too nice, too mm. pretty, too perfect. I think I was just a little homesick, to be honest, <laughs> but I ended up making some really, really great friends. I graduated 15 years ago, which makes me feel super old, but <laughs> I, so many of those friendships continue today. And, you know, I, I love those people and mm -hmm. so important to my life, both personally and professionally. Yeah. And, you know, it's just college, of course, like again, going all in effort. Um, I mean, college isn't cheap, right? So yeah. <laughs> like, get your money's worth, but the relationships, I mean, I think people say it, but I, you know, I really, I really felt it. Those relationships are so valuable. For sure. For sure. So uh, pre chubbies and post college, then I saw you did get into a couple different fields. You got into um, the private equity, some project management. What did the, that career journey look like for you? And, uh, along the way post-college yeah so 2008 was when i graduated it was really hard to find jobs yeah definitely and it was also like a stressful time so mm. the only job i could really get was just being an intern at a company that someone who i lived with started and mm. you know that internship turned into a full-time job and that was like a a startup you know, like it was, it was funded by um, sand hill venture capitalist out of the you know Silicon Valley. And that was my first taste of, you know, technology entrepreneurship. Wow. And it was, it was something where I learned a ton. I mean, I just started like grassroots marketing, going to conferences, helping with recruiting, just basically doing whatever needed to be done as an intern. And then yeah. kind of moved into a business development role, which is effectively sales and partnerships and then moved into more of a product management role which was really interesting and i learned a ton and i was mm -hmm. able to kind of explore and, and grow more of more of a technical understanding in terms of how because i didn't study computer science so yeah i had to learn a lot of this stuff which was super fun and uh, that then I think laid a little bit of the foundation for what then I could bring to Chubby's. But while I was there for about four, four and a half years, it was my, my only job out of college before Chubby's. Yep. And about three years in is when we kind of started talking about Chubby's and, and we, we, we actually started it nights and weekends. Wow. For about a year until we were about at a two million, roughly $2 million run rate. Wow. Just cause we were like risk averse, right? I mean, we, we, wanted to make sure there was a there there. Yeah. But yeah, that's, that's kind of where got the, the ball rolling in terms of like, what the heck am I going to do for a job? And then how it evolved into Chubby's. That's incredible. If you can kind of paint the framework here. So 2011 Chubby's officially launches. How did you guys launch with Shopify solely e-commerce? What kind of line did you launch with? What did that look like at the forefront of Chubby's? Before Shopify, so yes, Shopify, but even before Shopify, it was just, we were selling stuff in San Francisco in person okay. yeah. and event-based sort of thing, but then also extremely informally, we would make just very small runs. This was in the earliest of early days. And, yeah. you know, we would have like 10 pairs of shorts in our backpack and then we'd go out to brunch on Saturday. And it was very much a, a just a group organic group thing where yeah. we were all kind of into it. It was a group of people having fun and being very welcoming to anyone like who is interested in like, what are those ridiculous shorts? Cause there was a very distinctive component in 2011, yeah. 2012. You just short bright shorts were not a thing. Yeah. Like these are materially different from what everyone else would be wearing. So there was very much that coupled with just, the fun and ridiculous people who we authentically were and who our friendship, our friend group was. Uh, and I think how welcoming and open we generally were as people 
got people to just come up to us and just ask mm. like, what, what are those? And mm. what are you guys doing? But that's where it started. We just like the square car reader, oddly enough, had just become a yeah. thing. So you, like Venmo was not a thing. <laughs> and you, this was a way to take credit card transactions because, you know, taking cash was just not something that, that <laughs> was feasible. So we started selling in person first. And then, yes, absolutely. Shopify mm. made it just so easy to just get a store up and running. But yeah, started digital, started D2C only, did that for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I think we were the first Shopify plus store wow. and, but it was very much just, um, getting something up and finding like free hacky creative ways to get the word out, build a following, sure. um, create buzz, all these sorts of things. For sure. So manufacturing on the, the short side, how did that go? That first line, what did the R and D process look like? Um, where did you guys look for manufacturing? San Francisco is where we started. Yeah. That, that's where we were. And the first one was a failure in that person just took our money and didn't make any shorts. So oh, no. that was a, that was a fun little lesson. But the second one, you know, we actually had a sample. It was like an old, old pair of shorts that I think was handed down to Kyle, one of our founders. And we just thought this was an, this would be an awesome inspiration. Um, mm piece for us to kind of use as the the pattern and had a few made, you know, they were bad, <laughs> but <laughs> it was starting, you know, it was, it was taking a step and allowing that learning process to start, but, you know, made some small runs, we would wear it, made some tweaks and, and then slowly got to the place where we felt confident. Hmm. Like we sold some of them to our friends, but then, made some really good adjustments that I think got us into a place where we felt like, okay, we can actually sell these to people who maybe we don't know. Um, yeah. But they were just, they were still friends of friends, but yeah, I mean, that was it. It was making things out of San Francisco and we held on to making things in San Francisco for a long time, even though it was like ridiculously expensive. Yeah. But that's how we got started. I love it. So talking on the the marketing side, I feel like you guys became this organic marketing machine, especially like when I was in high school and I first found out about Chubby's. Um, what worked for you guys? I ad spend was maybe lower at this point, CAC. Um, what worked best for you guys? Influencer marketing, did that play a role at all? It's so funny. Um, no. And it was... It was just like finding every free thing that you could do that could potentially get you distribution, finding yeah. these little, uh, like at the time, um, one example was like Facebook likes mattered. Instagram wasn't even really a thing. Yeah. And certainly not TikTok, certainly not Snapchat, certainly not like any of these more mobile platforms. Um, and so it was Facebook. So it was just like, okay, how can, and, and you could effectively reach your whole audience. Yeah which was crazy. Right. So then it's like, how can we get as many likes as possible? So we would just run these crazy campaigns like promos or contests to just get people to like our page and <laughs> do so in a way that was effectively free. And, um, so one was just like a koozie giveaway campaign, like a, you know, beverage sweater sort of thing. And mm -hmm. got way too many <laughs> likes and we had to find out how to, where are we going to get all these cases? How are we going to mail them? <laughs> we don't even have, so we had to like find people on Craigslist who would come and like fill these envelopes with us. And then we realized that you can't put a koozie in an envelope and have it caught and, and only use like a 30 cent stamp or whatever. And so uh, we we're just like, Oh my God, we're, it's, we're screwed. Anyways, that was just one of those fun early things, but it was basically <laughs> just doing things that didn't cost money because we had no money. Yeah. But then it was also just like very organic. I mean, user generated content is like such an obvious thing today. It was not 12 years ago. Yeah. So, I mean, it was just like taking pictures of us and our friends doing what we normally do on the weekend. And it just like came across as being super authentic and, and this being just like a group of friends having fun and people feeling like they were a part of it and that they were yeah. our friends and that we, that we weren't a company selling stuff to consumers we were just people 
trying to live the dream of starting a business and making cool stuff for our friends. Yeah. And that, that word choice and that vibe was like, it, it leads you to behave very differently. But for us, we think it was extremely important to getting that early distribution, that early word of mouth where the friction, mm-hmm. I think, to becoming a part of our community, our, our way of being, um, our, our just, just, yeah, the broader, I mean, we called it the Chubster nation, but it was, it was, yeah. it was very easy. Um, and then, so yeah, we, you know, we didn't do traditional, like paid digital media, digital advertising for a long time. And then mm-hmm. you're right. I mean, the, the costs were much lower. You could, you could buy customers at, at a far lower lower price. And I think we got really good at it. Like we really liked finding like little pockets of arbitrage. Like when a new ad unit would come out, you could, you could do weird things with targeting and um, um, like objectives and conversion events and things like that, where it's like, if you just were in there long enough, you could find really cool things to do. And we, and we just tried to make our content as funny as possible. Yeah. And um, you know, some of that stuff, worked and you could get some really good distribution. And then we, we just tried to make great content that, that mm-hmm. made people laugh. Um, I think one of the other things that we did that I think helped getting some like free distribution was every Friday we would do what's called just the weekender where it was just like, we're not trying to say anything. It was just write a funny email and try to make people laugh and have it be something mm-hmm. that is forwardable to where, yeah people on our mailing list where, where there would be a very strong association with this is awesome. I'm going to forward this. And that led to some early growth in the, in the email list, which mm. was also like very, very helpful. So it was like a lot of grassroots stuff. Yeah. A lot of like my advice is like, start with free and then go as big and bold and memorable and fun as you can, but try not to spend any money and like mm. hold off on just doing, like handing money over to meta as, as long as you can. Yeah. Because not that that's the beginning of the end, but that's, that's, I wish we waited longer. Um, yeah. Because there's a lot you can do and you can build the brand and you can really start to generate this beautiful, like flywheel where people just come to you and they mm-hmm. think of you without having to be prompted by conversion ads like this. There, there definitely is like this, DR hamster wheel that we got on that most brands are on that Mm. makes you feel like you're doing a really good job for sure. But then when you look at like the fundamentals of your business, it's in a lot of ways eroding. And so I think that was, Mm. that was one of the things that looking back, if we were to do something differently, it would have been maybe wait a little bit and then be much more focused on like brand building work Mm. and investing in brand building earlier, even though it's like less quote unquote measurable. Yeah. So anyways, you know, those are a couple of thoughts on, on some of the early ways that we grew. Yeah, definitely. So I think the beauty behind the chubby story is how lean you guys operated, especially obviously marketing efficiency, as you explained, but at what point did you then grow the team as the business scaled? And what were those first critical hires? Would you say, um, to kind of for a turning point? That's a great question. We started with interns. Uh, So college ambassadors who were sort of like the most passionate and devout and there weren't really specific roles. Like it was very tactical at the beginning. It was just like divide and conquer and like this stuff needs to be done. So just like, let's figure it out. That's kind of how we started. And then um, one of them, John Mark ended up being our first employee and stayed with us. Um, post acquisition. I mean, just amazing. Wow. So super cool that that's, cool. that's, that that even happened, but, um, it, it was very much just like friends and who, who, I mean, none of us were formally trained at anything. So mm. it wasn't like we were hiring seasoned marketers or seasoned supply chain people. It was just very much like we got to that point, of course, but at the beginning it was friends, friends of friends, people who we just thought were smart, fun, capable, hardworking, passionate, and just bringing them on. And then it became in the, in the sort of beautiful mess of just divide and conquer, just find something that needed to be done and do it. Yeah. 
roles kind of naturally became obvious, but it was, it was mostly like starting with the people, starting with passion. People were just like, I love this. This is so cool. I want to be a part of this. Definitely. Yeah. Talking on uh, the community aspect that you guys really established. I mean, you, you mentioned it through some of the campaigns that you launched, but what is that consumer uh, for Chubbies that you guys found out over time uh, overall? It evolved. I mean, I think it was us, like it was the four founders and then it was our friends. And then it was, I think that's the thing. We fundamentally started the company and and built the product to meet our needs. Mm. And then we would make content that made us laugh and that made our friends laugh. And we constantly had our friends in mind as the people who are in our community and the people for whom we were making content, writing our emails, writing our ads, and mm. effectively just became an ever expanding friend group. Yeah. Which evolved over time, right? So when we started, we were roughly 25, you know, no mortgage, no kids, <laughs> three years out of college. And, and then where it is now, it's more of not that that doesn't exist, but it evolved right into yeah. families, debt, red dads, incorporating the kids, incorporating the, the overall family going from boozy brunches to family trips and playing with the kids in the backyard, blah, blah, blah. So, but the core in terms of like what we stood for never changed, right? It was always mm-hmm. weekend. It was always Friday at five. It was always levity. It was always not taking ourselves too seriously. It was always being, massively welcoming and fun and inclusive and all these sorts of things that never changed. Um, and I think that was attractive. And there were a lot of people who were brought in by that, like a pretty, there's a pretty broad, um, set of or broad set of groups of folks who are just down with what Chubby's does. And I think that's really cool. Mm, I love it. Kind of getting into the Chubby's uh, in the past five years and kind of like your your exit then, um, if you can kind of explain um, at what point did Chubby's reach um, that kind of determined your exit? Um, what was that time like for you as a founder as long as you've been growing this since 2008, really 2011? Uh, what was that feeling like kind of exiting the company then at that point? So I think... One way to put it is it's, it's one of those like classic overnight successes that took a decade kind of thing. Yeah. Also, you, you never, you never know. And you never know how these things will turn out. Looking back, it's very much, gosh, that was the joy of our lives to just be working with people we love on something we care about in the trenches, dealing with the fire drills, but also dealing, getting to experience and be a beneficiary of the community that was built, Mm. um, all of the, all of the UGC coming in, it's just showing people having a great time in their lives and our product. I mean, that is just one of the most rewarding things that you could ever be a part of. Yeah. So just a a joy being on the journey, really something that I maybe didn't appreciate as much when I was in it, but that I, I would recommend to any entrepreneur, it may suck and you may feel burnt out while you're in it, but just take it from folks who've um, quote unquote been on the other side of it. Uh, There's a little bit of like, when you're out of it, it's like, huh, what do I do now? You know, (laughs) what, what, where is, where is this um, not necessarily feeling of self-worth, but you know, where, where, where do I find that thing that I just dive into? Right. So it's, it's, it's just a joy to be in it, to be working on it, et cetera. So, and, and mm-hmm. we just feel very fortunate. Like it could, an exit could have just as well not happened. And, and that's totally okay. You just can't yeah. really control those things. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, we were at our best when we were just focused on the customer creating yeah. the best possible content we could, the best possible product we could and just letting everything else, like the chips fall where they may. And, and that is best. That is most possible when It's not about like grass is always greener. We will only feel like we've succeeded upon exit or it's short termism. Like just feeling like you could do this for the rest of your life is Mm -hmm. 
we didn't always have that mindset, but anytime we did, it was like, okay, that that's, I think when we were in the zone in flow, et cetera. Mm, I love it. Well, you, you kind of recapped at great points there, but Preston, I like to conclude each episode with this. Um, if you can share one piece of advice with an aspiring entrepreneur, maybe something you've learned or regret along the way, what would you say that would be? Without, without repeating the, the previous point, I think what I might say in addition to that is um, if, if you have the desire, if it's in you, if it's something that just keeps nagging at you, like just, just start and don't stop mm. because it's not going to be perfect at the beginning. You're going to look like an idiot. People are going to be like, what are you doing? You're not selling anything. Why are you doing that? Why are you taking time away from your friends or your family or whatever? But if it's something that is nagging at you, just explore it mm. and just be confident in saying this is something I feel really excited about and I don't know exactly how it's going to manifest, but I feel like I got to do it. And I know it's not going to sort of like pay off or be an obvious success at the beginning, but I think the key is just start and, and don't quit and know that it's a total, a total journey. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the joy. It's like the craft. It's the, it's the struggle. It's the agitation that truly is the joy in all of this. Mm. It's, it's not the, the PR. It's not the whatever stuff like the vanity stuff. Yeah. It's, you know, it's just creating stuff for people that they love that didn't mm. exist. It's that inventing something on behalf of other people to make their lives better. I, I, there's just truly nothing better in life. And it's like, mm. I think it's the fullest expression of a human life mm. in my humble end of one ex experience and opinion. Yeah. And so if, I think from an advice perspective, it's just, it's just that like follow, follow where you're being pulled. Um, but you don't have to like quit your job day one. It's something that like, it takes hard work. So it's going to yeah. take time. Yeah, and you build on the weekends. You, you said like one to 2 million or so just on weekends, like at start. It's incredible. It is. We feel very lucky. Like we feel very lucky. I mean, it, it took a lot of work. And then the second piece would be find someone else who is mm -hmm. similarly passionate and whether or not they become formal co-founders, but that really pulls you along when it gets hard. And then having that sounding board, having that pushback, you know, that tension. Some people can do it alone. More power to them. I cannot. And I, I just think having that is one of the best ways to not quit. And in, 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 in my mind with entrepreneurship, like the only way to fail is to quit. Mm. So having those other people in the ring with you in the arena with you is, is maybe the biggest thing that I would pass along is, is yeah. being the most valuable piece of advice. Mm, I love it. Well, Preston, thank you so much for joining me and to the listeners out there, make sure to check out chubbies at chubby shorts.com. Yeah, man. And then, and then if you also just want to like follow my writing on LinkedIn, I'm trying to yes, yes, yes. help future entrepreneurs think through how to build brands and how to kind of approach building a consumer brand, a consumer company. So it's just like search my name on LinkedIn and yeah. follow me and comment on my stuff. Tell me I'm an idiot. <laughs> Ask questions. Like yeah. that's for me now in, in this chapter of my life, that is the, the biggest joy of my life and yeah. how I feel like I can potentially give back. Mm, I love it. I, I've personally been gaining a lot from your LinkedIn posts and I'll make sure to leave that in the description below. So yeah, Preston again, thank cool. you so much.